Good morning. After I spoke the last time, somebody came to me and said, who are you? <laughs> so I thought that I would introduce myself very, very, very briefly. Um, my name is Anush, and I spoke last week, and I'll be speaking this week. OK. <laughs> um, we have four accounts of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written during the same time period, and several decades later, Ma, um, John was written. Now, when John got to write his gospel, there were, in circulation, three other gospels already written. So he got to read the others before he wrote his. And that's why when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you come to John, you find that many of the stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar, and they overlap. But when you come to John, none of the stories overlap. It's just completely different stories. None of the miracles and parables in the other three books, called the Synoptic Gospels, are repeated in John except for one miracle. And that's in John chapter 6. The context is Jesus, was, um, Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed about 10,000 people. And once they were all fed, this verse that we're going to look at is uh, John chapter 6, verse 12. And it says, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Why did Jesus not want to waste some food? I mean, after all, he fed so many people. And after all, he's able to make food whenever he chose, right? Why did God really care? Why did Jesus really care about not wasting food? He was just exhibiting another nature of God, which I will call the frugality of God. That nature by which God does not waste. I'm going to look at five things this morning in relation to us that God does not waste. The first thing that God does not waste is sin. When we sin, God is able to use that sin for his glory. He's able to use that sin to mold us and to make us and to discipline us. Now, what I'm not saying is that God has planned our sin. God has not planned our sin. God does not want us to sin. God is displeased if we sin. But if we do sin, God is able to take our sin and, and use it for his glory. In the first service, I, I gave this illustration and said, God and sin are so far apart from each other that if God was in that corner, sin is not in that corner, but sin is in that corner. And as I said that corner, two of the people thought that I was pointing at them, <laughs> and they kind of sunk down into their seats. Well, God has different ways of convicting each of us. Um, but if God is in that corner, Diagonally opposite is sin because God is so far away removed from sin and he's completely opposite to sin. So I'm not saying that God wants us to sin. No. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. God does not want us to sin. He hates sin. But if we sin, God is able to use that sin for his glory. Let's read a text. Judges chapter 4. Sorry. Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. Judges is the seventh book of the Bible. And I will read 14 verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let me just tell you the background of the story. The people of Israel kept sinning, and each time they sinned, God, will, God would allow their neighbors to come and conquer them and make them their slaves. And so when that happened, the people of Israel would cry out, and God would raise up a judge from among them to go and conquer their oppressors. One such judge was this guy by the name of Samson. And um, Samson, his claim to fame was that he was extremely strong. Um, I don't think he was very muscular. He had a lot of hair, but he wasn't very muscular, and he was extremely strong. All right, let's, let's read verses 1 through 4 in Judges chapter 14. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. 
So, so this is back in the day when parents still wanted their kids to, I mean, when kids still wanted their parents to set up dates. <laughs> His father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among your people? Again, this is back in the day when it was acceptable to marry your relative. Must you go on, um, must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She is the right one for me. And verse 4 says, his parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. Now when you read this passage, you find historical narrative. But right in the middle of historical narrative is verse 4, which is in parenthesis which is an edit put in, in the middle of a historical narrative by the author. And when you read just that edit, his parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. When you read that, you assume that God wanted him to marry a Philistine. The only problem is, God didn't. Now I'm gonna read four verses in sequence and then we will discuss them afterward. Joshua chapter 23, verses 12 and 13. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and, and if you intermarry with them and, assist, and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your back, and if that wasn't enough, thorns in your, in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Deuteronomy 7 verses 1, 2, and 3. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Two other verses. Numbers chapter 23 verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Isaiah 40 verse 8. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. So God said, do not intermarry. God doesn't change. God's commands do not change. It is unlikely that God decided, you know, just for Samson because I've chosen him. Just for Samson, I'm going to make a one-time exception, and he can marry somebody he wants. No. What I think happened was Samson had a problem with lust. He had a problem in dealing with women. And as you read his story, you find that he deals wrongly with the wrong women time and time and time again until it finally led to his death. In the grace of God, God took the sin of Samson and turned it around for his glory. God does not waste your sin. Again, I am not giving us license to sin. If we go out and deliberately sin, God will give us consequences and discipline for that sin. Sometimes that discipline can last the entire lifetime. But I can assure you that sins of the past and any sin we do, God is able to use for his glory. The second thing that God uh, does not waste are people encounters. People that come into our lives are, are not accidental. For a child of God, nothing is accidental. Some people may annoy us. Some people are pleasant uh, with us. Some people are painful to us. But not a single person that we encounter as believers um, None of them is accident. God uses every one of those people encounters. Let's read a verse, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Acts 8, 1 says, And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Let me tell you the context. Stephen was being killed. Stephen was one of the early uh, preachers when the church was growing and flourishing. And he had, um, and the Jewish authorities were annoyed by him, and so they killed him. And how they killed him was they stoned him. So the people who wanted to stone him, they came, they took off their outer cloaks, and they put it to the side, and they went um, after Stephen, 
and, and, and grabbed some stones and stoned him. One of those people, um, the person who was guarding the cloaks of the killers was Paul. And Paul was able to see Stephen, even though he didn't kill him, he was guarding and approving of his death. And as Stephen died, as he was being stoned and life was going out of him, he looked up to the heavens and said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing. If you read the book of Hebrews, you find that the Son of Man is not standing, the Son of Man is sitting. But in this case, the Son of Man was standing to welcome Stephen home. And so Stephen says, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing. And as he fell down dead, he said, Lord, do not hold the sin against these people. And Paul, or Saul, as he was called at that time, was standing back and watching the entire thing. About 25 years later, this is what he says in Acts 22, 20 and 21. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Paul never forgot that encounter with Stephen. When my wife was doing her last year in pharmacy school a few years ago, she had to do one or two months of rotations in, in different places. So she had a couple months rotations at some hospital, then another couple months in some other hospital, and then she had a couple months in some pharmacy. But her most boring rotation that final year was one or two months, I don't remember, at the corporate head office of some pharmacy. And she worked with this lady by the name of Rochelle. So she worked with her. Um, it was a boring rotation, and that rotation was done. The year was done. She graduated. And she was looking for a job. Guess who helped her to find a job that first year? Yes, Rochelle. Then we moved to Boston for a few years. Guess who helped her to find a job in Boston? Rochelle. Then we moved back to Chicago. Guess who indirectly helped her find a job? Yep, Rochelle. God does not waste people encounters, no matter how painful that encounter may have been. Maybe it is a difficult boss. Maybe it is a, a nagging neighbor. Maybe it is an annoying relative. For the people of God, God does not waste your people encounters. The third thing that God does not waste is time. We are often impatient, thinking that time goes away. Oh, I'm 25 years, I don't have a date. Or I'm 29 years, I'm not married. Or I'm 32 years, I've not studied anything. Or I'm 35 years, I've not finished studying. Or I'm 40 years, and I've never done anything for the Lord. You may think that your past years are wasted. Isaiah 49, verse 8 says, This is what the Lord says, In the time of my favor, I will answer you. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. Um, one of my most favorite verses in scripture is in an obscure uh, book of the Bible. Joel chapter 2. And if you can find it in your heart, turn to Joel, please. Joel is between Hosea and Amos, if that helps. Joel, a very short book, easy to miss. Okay, in Joel chapter 1, God is giving his people warnings. And he says this, let me read from verse 2 onward. Joel 1 verse 2 onward. Hear this, you elders, listen all you live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children and, and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. Verse 4 is interesting. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, the other locusts have eaten. If you were to tell me that God is going to punish us by locusts coming to liberty, you know, I don't care. Locusts can do what they want in liberty. I don't care. 
But if I am in an agricultural society, as these people were, and locusts came, four different kinds of locusts came and ate away everything that you've been working hard at all your life, then it matters. So this is a warning that God is giving to his people, saying that these locusts are going to eat up everything you've ever worked for. But the story doesn't end there. In Joel chapter 2, God says, even though I have warned you of these locusts coming, verse 12, Joel 2 verse 12, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. So God says, I've got this punishment waiting for you, because you have not turned to me. But if you will just turn to me, then everything will be all right, because I'm gracious and compassionate. Now we come to the verse that I want to talk about. I love this verse, Joel chapter 2, verse 25. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. He doesn't say, I will repay you for the, the money that you spent doing what you do. Or I will repay you the energy that you wasted building up your enterprise, but I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. God is able to repay wasted time. I became a believer when I was five years old. I don't know when you became believers. I don't know when you invited Jesus into your life. Maybe you were 25, maybe you were 35, maybe you were 55. And it's possible to think that your life until that point is completely wasted. But God does not waste time. If we turn to the Lord, God is able to repay us for the years the locusts have eaten. Paul says in 3 verse 12, in, in Philippians 3 verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. That word press on means to keep up the chase. Keep up the chase. Yesterday was the KC Marathon and um, some people ran in the KC Marathon. I'm glad you could show up after running um, the KC Marathon. Let's say that I was running the KC Marathon. I mean, the KC Marathon and I are so far away. <laughs> but let's say that I was running the KC Marathon. And after I started, I fell down, and um, by the time I got to my senses, it was about a few minutes, you know, I'd, I'd wasted about four minutes. And so I get up and I start running again. What do I need to do in order to catch up? I need to run faster and harder. That's what Paul is saying here. Paul was in his late 20s, early 30s when he became a believer. And everything what he did before that was wasted as, as far as he was concerned. So to catch time up, he pressed on. That's why in 2 Corinthians 11, 23, he says, I worked much harder than the other disciples, the other apostles. God does not waste time. Sometimes when you're in the ministry and you've come late into the ministry, it's possible to think, oh, I spent the last 25 years not doing anything for the Lord. I just wasted it on myself. But we can press on and God can give us the years that the locusts have eaten. The fourth thing that God does not waste are prayers. There are lots of examples of, of mothers that pray for their wayward children. But let me assure you this, ladies and gentlemen, not a single prayer that a child of God has prayed in accordance with the will of God will be wasted. I say in accordance with the will of God because many times we make prayers that are in not accordance with the will of God. Like the other day I prayed that uh, my lawnmower would just automatically go and mow my lawn. <laughs> Didn't work. Not a single prayer that we pray gets wasted. What have you been praying for? What have you been praying for? 
Let's just read a verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, for the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Have you prayed for something so intense that you could not even talk in the presence of God? Have you prayed for some burden so heavy that words could not describe it? And you just came into the presence of God and you had nothing to say. Charles Spurgeon in his sermon concerning prayer said this, the overflowing of the soul is the best praying in the world. Prayers that are indistinct, inharmonious, broken, made up of sighs and cries and damped with tears. These are the prayers which win with heaven. Prayers that you cannot pray, pleadings too big for utterance, prayers that stagger the words and break their backs and crush them down. These are the very best prayers that God ever hears. Have you prayed for something so long that you wondered if that answer was ever going to come? Have you prayed for something so long that you wondered that God, if God ever cares? Have you prayed for something so long that you wonder if God is ever going to do anything for you? Let's read Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. Revelation 5 verse 8. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The he is Jesus, the Lamb. And look what it says. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, and the incense is the prayer of the saints. Now, when you read Old Testament and you look at their sacrifices, it's not the smell of a burning animal that is aromatic. That's not aromatic. What makes the sacrifice sweet smelling is the incense that goes with the burning sacrifice. And the Bible says that God breathed in the sacrifice and was pleased with the aroma. That came from the incense. And when you read scripture, when you read this verse, it says that that incense right now is the prayer of the saints. It is as if when you prayed the last time in the will of God, that prayer went and made it to the bowl in front of God. There's an angel standing there with the bowl, with incense, and that was your last prayer. Let me just read another verse. Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 to 4. I'm reading from the NASB. It says, Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Now, if you read the context, you find that Jesus is standing right there. In verse 1 of that chapter, Jesus is right there. Let me just read the verse again. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer. He was given incense. Who gave him the, in the incense? Jesus gave him the incense. So Jesus is standing right there. And this angel is standing here with his bowl. And in this bowl is the last prayer you prayed, and the last prayer you prayed 25 years ago. And before he offers it to God, Jesus comes in and puts his incense. And the verse says, the smoke of that incense, which Jesus put in, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Ladies and gentlemen, if God, if Jesus had not gotten involved in our prayers, God wouldn't even listen to him. 
the only reason why God even looks at us is because of Jesus. There is no other reason. Every single prayer that you have prayed in the will of God as a believer goes into that bowl. And to that bowl is added the incense by Jesus. He puts his stuff in so that it's pleasing to God. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are too involved in the prayer of a believer who prays in the will of God for that prayer to be wasted. Let me say it again. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are too involved in the prayer of a believer who prays on the will of God for that prayer to be wasted. Finally, God does not waste experiences. God does not waste experiences. God uses experiences that we go through, circumstances that we go through. There is not a single accidental circumstance for a child of God, not one. God is a God, he is a Lord of our circumstances, and he is able to use our circumstances like a puppet for our sakes. Some of um, the reasons for our past painful circumstances we know, some of the reasons we don't know. And God is not obligated to tell us the reason for, what, uh, for why he does what he does. God is not obligated to tell us. Sometimes we think that we will come to know why he did what he did later on. Need not be. We can ask God the what, who, when, where, how questions, but we cannot ask God the why question. That is because the why question infringes on the sovereignty of God. And God will not let anything touch his sovereignty because he's sovereign. I'm not going to go into a verse, but Romans chapter 9, verse 20 talks about it. So you may not know the reason why you went through a painful past experience. But I can tell you this this morning, that God does not waste an experience. Let's read a couple of verses. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 16 and verse 13. Romans 16, 13. This is Paul writing that whole chapter he spends in greeting people. And in 16 verse 13 he says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Who on earth is Rufus? I have never even heard about him. Who is Rufus? I mean, if he said, um, greet Mark and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Rufus? Seriously? And Rufus's mother was like a mother to the greatest missionary in the first century. And I have no clue who it is. Let's read Mark chapter 15 for some clue. Mark 15. The context is that Jesus was, is going to be crucified. He was whipped, he was flogged, he was ridiculed. He was stripped, and now he is carrying his own cross, and he is going to be crucified. He marched through the streets of Jerusalem, and he came out of the west gate of Jerusalem, carrying his cross. And as he is coming out of the city limits, because it was the Passover time, the, the, um, the sacrifice was at 9 a.m. in the morning. So there were people coming into the city for that first sacrifice of the morning. One of those people was a person by the name of Simon. Turn your Bibles to Mark 15 and verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Alexander and Rufus were two little children who watched their father carry the cross of Jesus Christ. That experience never left him. Is it any wonder 
that he and his family became believers later on. So much so that Paul says, your mother has been like a mother to me. God does not waste experiences. J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, every single thing that happens to us expresses God's love to us and comes to us for the furthering of God's purpose for us. Thus, so far as we are concerned, God is love to us, holy, omnipotent love at every moment and in every event of every day's life. Even when we cannot see the why and the wherefore of God's dealings, we know that there is love in and behind them, and so we can rejoice always, even when, humanly speaking, things are going wrong. Let me tell you the story of a, of a friend of mine. She and I worked in a clinic together about eight years ago back in India. I moved here, she moved here a couple of years later, and she tried to get into dental school. She did the exam the first time, she failed. She did the exam six months later a second time, she failed again. She did the exam the third time and she passed and she got admission to the University of Pennsylvania at, at Philadelphia. Her husband was staying in New York, so, so every few weeks she would drive from Philly to New York and see her husband. One weekend, it was a very rainy weekend, um, but she decided to go anyway. Um, she drove up from, from Philly to New York, um, met her husband. The next morning, she said that they just laid in bed just talking about everything. Um, and then she got up and went to make him some tea. Um, she went to make him the tea, made him the tea, came back. He was lying face down, dead. A widow at 29. I spoke to her the night before the funeral. And she says, now I know why I failed my exam two times. Just so I could spend more time with my husband. She said, I have no more questions to ask of God. Not even the why question. She started a Bible study in her church, I mean, in, in her um, college. And the people that she was able to deal with the most were widows. God does not waste experiences. Nothing is wasted for a child of God. Nothing. Unfortunately, if you're not a child of God, everything is wasted. Your past sin, your past time, your past effort, everything is wasted. Mark 8 verse 36 says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? The life of a person that has lost a soul is a wasted life. So, so I'm going to give the opportunity if there's anybody here who wants to invite Jesus in, into their life. You can pray with me. Obviously, I'm not going to give you a magical formula that you need to pray. But if you genuinely ask God to come in and make life worthwhile after that, everything is going to be worth it. Let's bow our heads. If there's anybody here that wants to invite Jesus into your life, you can stay seated. Jesus came and lived and died and rose again for your sake and my sake. And now he is adding to our prayers and is interceding on our behalf in heaven. If you, if you want to invite Jesus into your life, you can pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you came into this world for me. Thank you for your death and your resurrection for me. Thank you that you're always concerned about me. I open my life and I invite you in and ask you to come in and take your residence within. I pray that you would make my life meaningful and restore everything that I lost in the past years. In Jesus' name.